recently, I've been, you know, I try to talk to people as often as I can. You know, that's, that's my job, talking with people, listening to people. I try to think that I do more listening than I do talking. But I've heard a lot of people talk about the fact that sometimes they, they feel lost. There's this feeling of being out of place, you know, being out of place in, in this, this world that they stand in, that they've lived in their whole life, but they still feel out of place, feel different. Sometimes that, that bothers people, that, you know, they, and they don't quite understand why they feel different. I'm talking about you know, God's people, God's people in, in his church. Now, for most of us, you know, we look around and we might be the only Christian that we know of outside of, of this congregation, outside of the church that, that keeps the Sabbath and the holy days, maybe the only one at work or at school or in our community that doesn't keep Christmas. And we stand out sometimes. And sometimes that can make us feel alone, even though we're around crowds of people. There's a really a reason. There's a reason for that feeling. There's a term that's used in several places. It's used in, in, the, in the scriptures, in the Bible. It's a term that I heard growing up used to describe these, these strangers who traveled to, to this country. They were English Puritans. They were seeking religious freedom back in the 1600s. And this term is a pilgrim. Okay. Sometimes I think, well, is our concept of a pilgrim accurate according to scripture? Or do we always go to that, that, that uh, idea, that concept from history books? Now, some of you from, uh, who grew up in, in different countries who didn't have the same history books you might have a, a different thought in mind, a different concept for this term. But this, this concept, this, this term is used in the Bible. And we're going to take a look at a few examples in the Bible of, of this term pilgrim and see if we can get an understanding of why it's used and how it's used in Scripture. In the New Testament, this word pilgrim, at least in certain translations, it's translated as pilgrim. It's used three different times, the particular word that we're going to look at today. It's a Greek word, peripedimos. At least that's my, my best approximation of, of how to say it, peripedimos. This word can mean pilgrim or can, can mean stranger. It's made up of, of two other Greek words, para, which is like alongside, something alongside, and also epidemio, which re refers to a stranger or an alien, somebody who, who's, who's different, but they're still alongside. They're there with others who belong, who aren't strangers. Some some uh, definitions might put this this term as a resident foreigner. Now this this word is used in three scriptures in the New Testament. It's, you can write down Hebrews eleven verse thirteen. We'll turn to these later on. Hebrews eleven thirteen. It's sometimes translated as pilgrims, but also as exiles. And somebody who's put out of their own their own country. Maybe they don't have their own country. Peripedimos is also used in the, in the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, and also in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Now it's either translated as strangers or exiles or pilgrims in each of these verses, but it also holds the connotation of one who resides as an alien, one who, you know, they're not from that place where they live. Now if you word studies relate the same idea, the helps word study, sometimes translate, translates this word as sojourner or foreigner, and it literally means somebody passing through, but still with per, a personal relationship with the people in that, that country, that locale where they live. So that's the, the concept here that we're talking about, that this word conveys. You know, somebody who is just passing through, they're not, they, they're not where they belong permanently. Maybe they're traveling through to their destination. But there's this certain relationship that they have with those people that are around them, who belong there. And, you know, it's kind of, we think of it like us, you know, we, we do things differently, we stand out, but we still, you know, we still get along with those people who are around us. Bayer's Greek lexicon uh, says that this, this word could mean one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside there 
by the side of the natives. I know there are people here who can relate to that directly. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can relate to that coming from a, a different place besides New York City. We see uh, this, in, in the definition of this word, peripodemos, we see this temporary nature. Something that's temporary, that's not permanent. And that's one concept that we want to remember when we're looking at this word, this term that's translated as pilgrims, or sometimes strangers or sojourners. But there's this temporary native. Pilgrims are not native to the place that they live. Now we're going to take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1 here. Let's turn over there to 1 Peter 1. We're actually going to do a little bit of Bible study in this, in this book of 1 Peter. We're going to take a look at some different places where there are some, some instructions given. So in 1 Peter 1 verse 1, it says, Peter... An apostle of Jesus Christ. So the disciples, when they're writing letters, you know, when we, we write letters, sometimes we introduce ourselves. Sometimes we, we wait till the end and, and, and do that at the end. So Peter introduces himself so people know who this letter is from. And he says, To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now these are places that are in, in, in the area that we think of as Turkey today, in the Middle East. But these were pilgrims. There were people living there who didn't belong in these places, or they weren't originally from those places. And he uses the word dispersion. The dispersion. Now we're going to look at this, uh, the use of this word or this term dispersion in a few different um, places to get an idea of who these people are that Peter is writing to. Who is he writing this letter to? Just some strange people that he heard that, that were out there He's like, I'm, I'm just going to write a letter. I heard these. there's a group of people there. They feel kind of strange. I'm going to write them a letter to help them feel better. Now, we, we know that's not the truth. Let's, let's hold our place in 1 Peter. We'll come back. And let's turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, and verse 35, it says here, Then the Jews said among themselves, so there are the Pharisees here talking to Christ, and Christ in the previous verses says that in a little while he's not going to be with them any longer. Verse 34, it says, You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. He's talking about himself returning to the Father, and they won't be able to find him. But they're thinking in the physical these, these individuals didn't understand who Christ was. And then the, they said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we should not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? So he's talk, they're, they're talking about the dispersion among the Greeks. They're referring to other Jews who are living in a different country in Judea. They're not living in Judea, their home anymore. They're dispersed out in, in the world. And in Greece, living among the Greeks here, it's talking about. So that's this dispersion. It's God's people that are dispersed in a different place. That's what that's that's who Peter is writing to. This um, the uh, dispersion is also used, or this concept of dispersion is also used in James one, verse one. When James writes his letter, you can write it down and, and look at it later. He said, you know, he introduces himself, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. So he even specifies the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, God's people. Now they're referring to the physical people, but also the spiritual people, the spiritual 12 tribes, spiritual Israel that they're writing to. And this word scattered that's used by James has that same that same concept of dispersion, this, these people that are dispersed. Now, before we go back to 1 Peter 1, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And we can read about some other strangers, some other pilgrims. Now, these people that Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, refers to, they're strangers and they're pilgrims in two different ways. And also these people that, that Peter is writing to, that James is writing to. 
They're pilgrims, they're strangers in two different ways. First of all, as Jews, they were scattered about away from their homeland in a place that that wasn't their home. They they you know they remembered the promised land. And the people in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, some of them were looking for that promised land. But they knew there was something beyond even that physical promised land. Now these are people, you know, the, the people that Peter and James were writing to, they're likely uh, dispersed by the Babylonians, taken from their homes and scattered. And God scattered his people because of their sins. He took them out of their promised land and scattered them about. And they became pilgrims and strangers. And once they were called by God, those that were called by God, they became Christians. And they were pilgrims and strangers as Christians in their communities. They stood out. They didn't keep Christmas. They studied the word of God. They kept the Sabbath. Some of them weren't Jews, but they were still doing things like the Jews, including the Sabbath and the holy days, eating only clean meats, things like that. And sometimes they were persecuted because of they, they didn't you know, follow the, the norm. They stood out. And they fled from Jerusalem, from Judea, because of this persecution. Now let's read in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 13. We won't read through all these uh, these pilgrims, these strangers who lived in strange places, who didn't belong right where they were. In verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Now this is important to understand the nature of these pilgrims. They didn't receive the promises that they sought after. They didn't find their homeland. It says, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They knew that they were different, that they stood out, that they were strangers, that they were parapodemos. They were different. Verse 14, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. And we look at examples such as Abraham. God called Abraham to go into a strange land that wasn't his home. He became a stranger. And he was different. And in some ways, he was different because God had blessed him so much. But he stood out. And if he wanted to, he could have you know, shook his head at God and said, No, that's okay. I'm going to stay here. And he could have just stayed where he was, or he could have returned back to his home. He was going to a place that was it was difficult to live. Things weren't set up for him yet. His family was back in his, in his home, the land that he came from. He could have returned. He could have turned back away from God and tried to do things his own way. Verse 16, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. So we see these strangers desiring something that was yet in the future something that they didn't have yet. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now it goes on to describe even more of these strangers and pilgrims. We'll read through some of them here. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So we talked about Abraham. Let's skip down here. I'll let you read through some of these on your own later on. Let's skip to verse 32. It says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail, fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. So many people. Now we think of so many people. They were the minority, of course. They, they stood out. They were different. but They knew that they were seeking something better than what they had. Verse 33, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, Stop the mouths of lions. We think of Daniel. Daniel was a, a pilgrim. He was living in a very strange place. And people were trying to get him to, to turn away from God. Verse 34, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight, to, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. So the so these aliens are other aliens, strangers, invaders. Verse 35, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. I'll keep this in mind for later. The people that are tortured, they're focused on something better 
than what is right in front of them. Still others, in verse 36, had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. They, they didn't see these things right in front of them. They knew something was, was coming. They knew there, there was a better future. That's why they maintained that, that strangeness that they, they had been practicing. It was different than the world. God having provided something better for us, it says. For us. Now we have to put ourselves in this place as well. God has provided something better for us as well. That they should not be made perfect apart from us. We're also included in this list of strangers, of pilgrims, of those that are different, the parapodemos, that we stand out. We're just here alongside other people temporarily. This isn't our permanent home. Even though some of us might be in the same place that we were born, we're raised here, and we'll die here. But this isn't our permanent home. This is just temporary. They didn't receive the promise. There's something better. And we haven't received our promise yet either. All of God's people are pilgrims. They're sojourners traveling on their way somewhere else to that true homeland, to the kingdom of God that we're looking for, that we're searching out to find. And we haven't re received that promise, but we will at the same time as these that we read in, in the book of Hebrews, when Christ returns, we will receive those promises. But right now we're in a place that doesn't you know, doesn't always accept us. They, they see us as different. Now let's turn to 1 Peter, and let's go through some of these lessons that we can learn some instructions from Peter, inspired by God, for pilgrims, including us. So we're going to look at five different instructions in the book of First Peter. Now these are instructions to encourage us, sometimes to direct us, sometimes to, to give us some discipline and refocus us that we need. Now the first instruction is that pilgrims must live a different way of life. Pilgrims live a different way of life. They live by faith and not by, by our own sight. As we read about in, in Hebrews, those people, they had to live by faith, by things that they couldn't see. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we have, we have to be sober-minded. We have to prepare our minds to understand that there is something that's going to be brought to us in the future. Verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. In other words, before we were called by God, we were in ignorance. Before we accepted that calling and became strangers and pilgrims, we were in ignorance. We didn't understand these things, but now we are. We obey because it's a better way of life that it's going to be lived in the future by all the world. Verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, in everything that we do. We're supposed to be holy, be set apart for something special. Verse 16, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. We're supposed to be like God. Now this verse refers to Leviticus. Chapter 11, that talks about clean and unclean meats. Uh, the reason that God gave us clean and unclean meats, where we're supposed to, to only eat the, the clean meats, is that that reflects being set apart, being different, being holy. Why God is holy, that's a reflection of that. The Israelites, when they were wandering in the wilderness, and when they finally received that, that promised land, that temporary promised land that wasn't even their permanent home, they were supposed to be an example nation, weren't they? They were supposed to stand out, to be different, and they were supposed to uh, be a, a light to those around them. 
And people would say, okay, they're different for a reason. And look, they're, they're being blessed. That was the idea. They were set apart. And we are set apart to be different. In chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, Beloved, as Peter continues, he's writing to these congregations, the people that he cares about, who he loves, who he's caring for. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. This is another place where that term, peripedimos, here is translated as pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. You know, fight against those, those, those beings that we're trying to get rid of, as we read about in the sermonette. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, just like the Israelites, they were supposed to stand out, to be different, to be honorable, living honorably, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now that's talking about when Christ returns in that day. Some people will never understand that until Christ returns, even beyond that, until the second resurrection. And they'll look back and they'll remember, oh yeah, I remember those people, they were strange. They did things a little bit differently. They said they were Christians, but they didn't do things how other Christians do them. They didn't keep Christmas, they didn't go to church on Sunday. They were different. I remember them. People are going to say that. And they're going to glorify God because of our example of standing out, of being set apart, of being holy. We're supposed to stand out, to be different, and that's in a positive way. It's a good thing, to show glory to God. Now, chapter 4, as we're pulling out some different verses on these, these different instructions, chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. We're supposed to have that same mind that's free from sin, that ceases from sin. That same you know, way of life, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. That's supposed to be why we live. That's supposed to be our focus, for the will of God, to, to please God rather than our own flesh. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Just talking about different sins there. And you could put any sin that you'd sinned in the past, you could put that there. We've spent enough time on those things in the past. And we're supposed to be different now. No longer do we go after those things. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Now, this is going to happen. You know, people, they sometimes speak evil of us because they, they don't agree with how we do things because we're different. They try to say, well, why don't you come and do what I'm doing? This is the way that you're supposed to do it. I have all this tradition behind me. I have all these things that are, that are good that I enjoy, but we're different. You know, we look for it at the scripture instead. But some people are going to, they're going to talk badly about us. They're going to, you know, sometimes behind our backs, sometimes to our faces. They're going to disagree with us and some people are even going to persecute us. In the New International Version, it, it words this, this verse 4 in chapter 4, it says, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living and they heap abuse on you. Sometimes that'll happen. People heap abuse on us because we're different, because they don't agree with us and how we live according to God's word. Chapter 5, starting in verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. In his eyes, we stand out. He paints a target on our back and says, Okay, that's one of those strangers. That's one of those peripedimos that belong to God. I'm going to go after that person. That's what he does. Verse 9, it says we're supposed to resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Those other strangers that live across the, the other side of the world. This week we've been praying for our brethren in Angola. Who, the, the doors of their church halls, their church buildings, have been closed by, because of the the government. Uh, right now, we're, we're thankful that those doors have been reopened. Uh, 
hopefully that's not temporary, but they're, they're persecuted. They're going through, you know, the difficulties. And in this country, we're probably going to go through those same difficulties. And they'll understand because they've been there. And they'll be able to pray for us just as we are praying for them. But we, we stand out and we live differently. We have to remember that pilgrims, these parapodemos, God's people in the world, they live a different way of life. They live by faith rather than what is right in front of them. We're supposed to live a different way of life. Now, the second instruction is that pilgrims are often tested by trials. We talked a little bit about that just now, but pilgrims are all often tested by trials while they're traveling to that, that homeland, to uh, that permanent home. Back in chapter 1, we'll pull out some different verses. I think Peter's uh, inspired writing style is interesting. You know, he doesn't put everything in a nice little box here. These are the things that I want you to read about this topic, and here's the next topic. But it's kind of scattered throughout, almost like a story, or almost like, I don't know, like he's writing a letter to somebody. And he's just, you know, he's thinking as he's inspired by God, he's writing these things down. Chapter 1, verse 6, it says, In this you greatly rejoice. So we rejoice in the future promises that we have in salvation, in the faith that God has given us the hope that God has given us, we rejoice in that. It says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. We were, you know, sometimes given trials to go through. Sometimes God gives us those trials. Sometimes we bring those trials on ourselves. And sometimes those trials come from other people, from our enemies. Verse 7, there's a reason behind that. The, those trials, there's a purpose behind trials that we go through, that the genuineness of your faith, remember we're supposed to live by faith, but it's supposed to be genuine faith. So the genuineness of our faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when Christ returns, you know, we're, we're hopefully going to be found by God to be faithful up until that end. And we're tested to see how faithful we are. Sometimes we're tested as a congregation, as an organization, as a, a spiritual organization. Sometimes we're tested as individuals. But we're tested to see what, what we're made out of, to see what our character is. Now in chapter 3, let's turn over to chapter 3. Still in First Peter, in chapter 3, verse 13, it says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of of what is good. This is a bit of encouragement here for us. Who's going to touch us if we're doing what is good? If we're right with God, we might be tested, we might be put through trials, but who's really going to be able to test us or to, to touch us if God has our back? He's protecting us in whatever way that, that he, he, he decides to. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. It's a good thing that we suffer for righteousness' sake. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. This is some real encouragement that we have here. We aren't supposed to be troubled. We, we can't care about those threats that, that come against us. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We have to expect these things to come and be ready. Verse 16, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. There's going to come a point when people will see that, that we weren't doing something that was strange. It might have been strange to them, but we're doing something that's honorable. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. If we did something evil and we're suffering for it, that's our own fault. But if we're suffering for doing good, that's not shameful. That will shame those who, who might cause us to suffer at a certain point. For Christ, in verse 18, also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring to us, bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So Christ, who we follow, he suffered, and he did nothing wrong. It wasn't his fault, but he was persecuted. 
And so sometimes we suffer just as he suffered. Chapter 4, now in verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Now again, we have to expect these, these trials. They're, they aren't supposed to be a surprise. We don't always see them coming, but we have to expect them. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. It's going to be amazing what we have to look forward to that, you know, being spirit beings along with Christ, when he returns, we're going to be changed and we're going to become like he is and we'll see him as he is. But we have to go through that suffering first. Now, chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, and here Peter reiterates some reasons for that suffering, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That's more reason for this, these trials that we go through, not only so that we can be like Christ, but also so that we can be perfected like him. Not just to begin to, to understand who he is and what he went through, but also to go through these things, to establish us, to build up our faith, to strengthen us, and to settle us. There's a certain comfort in knowing what is ahead of us that's good, but also to understand that we'll go through trials to get to that. But it settles us knowing that God has our back. We can be calm. We can be patient. And we can continue to, to seek God rather than look at the, the trials that we're going through at the moment. We're often tested by trials. And there's a purpose in that, to perfect us, to change us for the better. Now, the third instruction that we have here written by Peter is that pilgrims must endure together. Pilgrims must endure together in truth and love. We have to have both of those things. We have to know the truth, to, to seek it, to practice it together, and also to, to have love, to have care for those that are around us, both in and out of the body of Christ. Back in chapter 1, it says in verse 22, First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So in other words, a pure love. Actually loving one another, not just putting on a nice face sometimes. It's easy to do that. You know, we, we, we greet one another. Well, nice to each other. We're supposed to do those things too, but this is talking about a genuine care for one another that we have to, to have in our hearts, a sincere love. And it says, through the Spirit, this is talking about God living through us, showing His love through us. We're supposed to allow God to do that, to work with Him for that. Chapter 3, in verse 8, it says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. That means we think about each other. Not only do we do we think on the same scriptures, we, we read the same word, we practice it, but we also think about one another. We're not just thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about each other, having compassion for one another. It says, love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. So we are supposed to even be nice to one another. Sometimes that's hard to do. But we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to love each other. It says as brothers. It means, you know, we're family. We're in this together. We're family. We're going through these things together. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. God calls us to inherit blessings in the future. And he gives us blessings now. He gives us the truth. He gives us his love, his forgiveness. And we're supposed to pass those blessings on to others. We're supposed to be blessings to others as God is to us. Verse 10, for he who would love life as and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Even talking about the words that we use and how we use those words and his lips from speaking deceit. 
Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. We're supposed to be peaceful people, and we seek peace with others. We seek peace with God. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. It says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So we're supposed to be loving people so that God's face is not turned away from us or against us, as it says here. And so our, our, our prayers are not hindered. So we're supposed to pass on those blessings that God has given us. Chapter 4, in verse 8, it says, And above all things, I think Peter has a tendency of saying this, things like this, above all things, finally. So he's making a point, you know. Now this is really important stuff, that's what he's saying here. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. So even above all the other things, even if you mess up on all the other things, Above all things, most importantly, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. That doesn't, you know, give each other permission to sin, but that's talking about forgiveness of sins. That love, forgiveness is part of that love, covering a multitude of sins. And we all do have a multitude of sins that need to be covered up to be forgiven and forgotten. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. I think that's a fun verse. Be hospitable to one another. Take care of each other's needs. But do it without grumbling. Don't complain about it. And that's that sincere love. We should desire to take care of one another. On the other hand, you know, we can't, you know, we can't expect that somebody is is ready for that. You know, sometimes people are, are, they might not see our needs. We have to be able to express our needs to talk to each other about that. Um, But we have to be the first one to step out and be hospitable rather than just wait for somebody to come to us. We have to be hospitable without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Some people are are good at at cooking meals and taking care of people that way. Some people have, have a listening ear. You know, and, and they're willing to and ready to, to counsel with people. But whatever our, our gifts are, or whether they're physical gifts, spiritual gifts, we have to be ready to use them as we've been given gifts. You can write in your notes Hebrews chapter 13. The first few verses there talk about entertaining strangers. How do we know if this stranger isn't, as it, as it talks about there, an angel? Or how do we know this person that we've We've, uh, you know, we met on the street. Maybe we've never seen them before. Maybe they're uh, being called by God. They're going to show up in church next week, and they're going to remember that interaction that we had. But we're supposed to entertain strangers. That, that doesn't mean we just drag somebody off the street, but that means that we take care of other people, even in our communities. Uh, you know, I always think about people who are rushing in to try to, to come into the U.S., whether legally or illegally, And it's, you know, the government, they they decide whether they're supposed to come in or not. But we are supposed to take care of them once they're living alongside us as strangers. And we have to remember that we were once strangers. God's people, Israel, they were supposed to remember that. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They were strangers. They were pilgrims. And then they came to their, their temporary homeland. But when people came in... To live with them, they were supposed to be hospitable to them, to take care of them, because that was a reminder that they used to be that person. They used to need that help, that handout, that hospitality. You can write in Deuteronomy chapter 10 in your notes, verses 17 through 19, talks about showing no partiality, loving strangers. We pass along God's love to those who are around us even in this land that we live in temporarily. We have to remember that we are supposed to endure together through those trials in truth and love. We're we're a team, and this is a team effort that we endure together. Now the fourth instruction that we have as we're going through these instructions to pilgrims, to strangers, including us, pilgrims are to submit, to show respect to God. These parapodemos that live in a strange land, they have to submit sometimes to that strange land. And that's with a purpose, 
to show respect to God. Chapter 2 in 1 Peter, in verse 13, it says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So this is talking about our government. We don't have a king, we have a president. We're supposed to submit to his decisions that he makes. Now again, of course, this is within the framework of as long as they're not telling us that we should go against God's word. No, of course not. We're supposed to keep God's word above all else. But we submit to the, to the decisions that were made, and we keep the laws as those laws exist. But in verse 14, when it's talking about governors, I kind of think of this as like the, you know, the, the police officers that are in, in this country, that are in this city, as they're sent out by the, the king, the, the president, the governor, for the punishment of evildoers. That's their job, to go and punish those who are going against the law. And hopefully, although we don't see as much of this, it says, for the praise of those who do good. We don't need to see more of that. We don't see enough of that. There's too much evil in this world. But here it's talking about submitting to that, you know, the, the rule of law that exists in whatever country we live in presently. Verse 15, for this is the will of God. It's God's will. We have to remember that he is the one who raises up kings and presidents and governors. He raises those people up. He puts them in place. And ultimately, he guides the overall goings-on of, of the world, of all the governments. And he allows for those people he puts in place to make certain decisions. And we respect that authority as God has given them that authority. That by doing good, by following the laws of the land, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. If we're doing what's right according to the laws, then they, they can't say anything against us. At least not really. Sometimes that does happen anyway. In verse 16, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. In verse 17, it says, honor all people. We show that respect to other people. It says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So there's a certain level of submission that we have that gives honor to those who are above us. Whether it's in this, this, this city, this country, and even in the church, we submit to leadership. Whether it's your pastor or the president of the church, there's a lot of people above me that I have to submit to, that I have to listen to. And I give them the, the respect that they deserve because God put them in, their, in, in those places for a reason, for a time. And I do that to honor God, ultimately. Verse 18 of this same chapter, continuing on, it says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. In our jobs, we listen to our boss, but also to the harsh. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're pushed, we're, we're persecuted a little bit or something, you know, in our job. Uh, that comes out sometimes around the holy days, the Sabbath, when people are trying to get us to, to work on, on Saturdays. You know, but if we're if we're gentle, if we're respectful, then you know when they go against us, when they try to get us to break God's law, they have nothing to stand on. They can't say that you know we weren't doing our job, we weren't good workers, and then it has to be over the Sabbath that they might you know, let us go, fire us. And that's okay as long as we're doing what's good. But we shouldn't be the one to, to, be, uh, to be evil, to go against our, our boss, to those who are above us. For this is commendable in verse 19. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten you're, for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So this is part of that submission to those who are above us. And that shows that respect to God. It's, it shows our our faith to God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When he was persecuted, he didn't yell and shout against those who were trying to kill him. He took it patiently. 
Uh, it's a way of showing respect for those who are who are sometimes persecuting us. You know, we don't try to do evil against them when they're pushing us. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He was committed to God the Father. And so he knew that there was, there, there was something better coming. He knew the promises. He knew that he was going to be resurrected. Just as we know, we're going to be resurrected. And so we take these things patiently. We submit to show respect to God. Let's see. There's a few more verses on this one. Chapter 3 talks about husbands and wives. Now, this is important as well. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. A good example, showing mutual respect. Mutual respect in that relationship. And that shows that, you know, that respect that, you know, God is, it has, has placed this marriage institution in existence. He said, this is how you should do things. And in order for that relationship to be successful, people have to have this mutual respect, this submission, listening to one another in that relationship. And it, it shows a good example to that other person. I won't talk about Lena and I, you know, sometimes I, I do something that's, that's terrible that, you know, I say something bad about her. Hopefully not. Hopefully I don't do that. <laughs> but she has a good example. She takes it patiently and she talks to me. She listens to my decisions. You know, that, that it's my job to be the husband. And so my wife has to submit to me. And of course, I have to give her that honor and respect. Later on, it talks about husbands. Verse 7, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding. It's a mutual submission, a mutual respect between the husband and wife, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, talking about physically weaker in general, and as being heirs together. This is important. Husbands and wives, neither one has, has supremacy spiritually. They have the same promises, husbands and wives, together. Heirs together of the grace of life. Now, this is really interesting. It says that your prayers may not be hindered. That relationship between a husband and a wife, if that isn't good, that could hinder our prayers to God. That could hinder our relationship with God. So it's important to, to have that mutual respect, that submission, that understanding, that willingness to work together in that marriage relationship. Otherwise, it hinders our relationship with God. You can write in your notes, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 32 it talks about the fact that, you know, that relationship between a husband and a wife mirrors the relationship between the church and Christ. The church is the bride of Christ, and we submit to his leadership, to his rule, and we're won over by his good example. He suffered to show us how to suffer, how to live. Now in chapter 5, a few more verses here, it says, in verse 5 of chapter 5, it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. There's a certain respect that's supposed to come with those who have been around longer, who should have, hopefully they have more wisdom than, than those who are younger than them. But there's this idea of, of submitting, and, and continues on, it says, Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility. So all of us are supposed to have this mutual respect. We listen to one another. We respect each other, and we encourage each other humbly. It says, for God resists the proud. If we think that we're better than, than anybody else here, anybody else, then God is going to resist us. We have to humble ourselves. It says that he gives grace to the humble. That's supposed to be our attitude, that attitude of submission, of respect. So we submit to others. We submit to each other. We submit to the government that's in place. And we do that ultimately to show that submission to God. That's the purpose in that. The pilgrims have to submit in different ways to show that respect to God. Ultimately to show God that submission. Now the last instruction that we have here is the pilgrims must focus on future blessings. 
We have to stay focused on the future. Otherwise, otherwise we're not going to be able to make it through what's right in front of us, the trials that we're going through, the hardship. Those feelings of being alone, of being strangers, we won't be able to endure those things unless we're focused on the future. Chapter 1, in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. God has given us hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We know that because he was resurrected, we have a chance of being resurrected. That's that hope that we have. In verse 4, to an inheritance, future blessings, an inheritance, part of the kingdom, heirs together with Christ. And it says, incorruptible. Incorruptible. And that's different than even the, the physical blessings that we have that are now in existence. Those things are corruptible, the physical blessings. There's a temporary nature to the, to the, you know, the existence of a pilgrim. We're living in a temporary place. Things are temporarily difficult. But we look forward to an incorruptible inheritance, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. God is preparing that city that he's going to bring down at the right time. He's preparing it for us, and he's also preparing us for that city, for those promises. Verse 5, talking about us, we're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We're going to be changed. We're going to be revealed in the last time when Christ returns. But we're being ready Right now, we're being made ready. We're being perfected. Now, dropping down to verse 10, it says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. All the words that we have written in this book, these were prophesied by the prophets of God. They were written by those that God inspired. And some of them, well, they knew in part, just as we only know in part, we even have the pleasure of knowing even more than them because we have everything compiled together in this book, bound together for us to read and to understand. So we know that the, the prophets searched these things. They asked God to understand these things. They were searching for that future, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. They knew a Messiah was coming, that he would have to die, and then he would be raised up so that we could be raised up. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit. Sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. That's interesting to, to note. These are things that angels desire to look into. Angels don't have the same promises that we do. We have these promises to look forward to, and we have to stay focused on these future blessings, on the kingdom of God. The New Jerusalem talks about the New Jerusalem in Revelation, chapter 3, chapter 21. The government of, of Jesus Christ, it's going to be on his shoulders that will never end. It's a perfect government. It'll be easy to submit to that government because it'll be perfect, it'll be righteous, it'll be fair, and easy to submit to we have the kingdom, an eternal life in that kingdom that's promised to us. We have that to look forward to. We have to remember these five instructions. We're pilgrims. We have a temporary life that's fit in these physical bodies, and we live in a temporary place. This isn't our permanent home. And we have to remember those instructions. We have to live a different way of life. We live by faith rather than what's right in front of us. We're often tested by trials, and in those trials, we have to endure together in truth and in love. We have to endure in our faith together. And while we're here in these temporary places, we have to submit. We submit to others. They might not be right, but it's our job to submit because we want to show that respect to God because he's put people in places for a reason. And we have to stay focused on the future blessings that are coming. Eternal life in God's kingdom. So we don't get discouraged in our temporary life as pilgrims now.